Okay. So here it is, the first follow-up video to our weekly behind the scenes videos here in the shop. Now what I promised you was if you asked a question and I chose your question, you would get some of these. It's a three pack of our new stickers. It's a big tire garage sticker, bad old wagon sticker, and then a lockjaw sticker. And what I did is I just randomly went through the comment section of the first video, picked a bunch of questions, and then just, this time I chose four, because I figured first video, why not do four people first? So there were a lot of questions that were the same. And when that happened, what I did is I went ahead and I just sort of picked like one of the first ones. So there's a lot of questions actually about my hair, which was quite humorous to me, but you know, I guess it's just everyone wants to know. So the question was from John, I think it's Heinz. So his question is, okay, I got a stupid question. I guess since this is your first video back, what product do you use in your hair to get it to stand up? I know wood glue works, but that doesn't look like what you're using. And I enjoy the content on whatever platform you are on. Well, John, thank you very much for your question. You'll be getting a sticker pack in the mail. Now, there were a lot of variations on this question. Like, when am I gonna cut my hair? What's with the hair? And that's, so here's the long story of my hair. So my whole life, I always had kind of weird hair, you know? So I grew up child of the 80s and the 90s. So I had the mullet, I had the long rockers, 80 hair, uh, had a little bit of everything, had blue hair for a while. And my theory was my father went bald at a very young age. So he was bald. Um, and I kind of knew that I was probably gonna go bald at some point in time. So I had this theory that I'm always gonna enjoy my hair. So I've always had like crazy hairstyles and a lot of different hairstyles my whole life. That's just sort of how it's been. How it's been. Um, and so lucky for me, I didn't go bald. So I get to still have fun with my hair. So I'm 50 now and I get to still have spiked up hair. Um, how it started was I had, when I started doing this original TV show, I had like short spiked hair. My son at the time was growing up and he was getting taller than me. And uh, as he got close to being taller than me, I made a joke that no, cause the hair counts. Uh, I think it had been a long time since I got my hair cut. So the hair was getting taller and taller and taller. And it just kind of stuck that I had these just tall spiked hair and that just came became known as the off-road guy with the tall spiky hair and when you're on tv it's kind of you just learn to live with it um, the beauty of it is is if i ever want to go around anywhere and people kind of not recognize me i just don't spike my hair uh, i look a little bit like chris farley back from the dead and uh that that's one benefit to having the spiked hair if i don't want to be recognized i just don't put my hair up it takes people a lot longer to recognize me without the spiked hair um, the other question was how long does it possibly take to get my hair spiked like this? And it doesn't take that long at all. I'll show you a short video clip right now of basically me spiking my hair. It's pretty easy. Get the gel on your hands and then flip it up and put it up and you are ready to weld all day long. And then lastly, what product do I use? Well, I use a product called Iced Spiker. Uh, it's the one gel that I found actually keeps the hair up. Even when I wear a welding helmet all day, uh, it doesn't basically squish it down. It doesn't make it super hard. When I'm out, people always want to touch it and it's not really hard. You can run your hands through it. That's, it just, it's, it's, it works, you know? Um, and so there's the question. Hopefully that answers all the questions about the hair. Where did it come from? What product do I use? And how long does it take for me to get ready in the morning? Which is actually, you know, 10, 15 seconds, to be honest with you. Um, I will say this, that spiker stuff, it is literally like glue. If you don't wash it off your fingers, your hands do start to stick together. So it is kind of glue, I think, in the long run, but that's just the way it is. And the next uh, question is, when am I gonna cut it? Never, because as long as I have hair, I'm gonna do fun stuff with it because someday, I'm not gonna have hair anymore. So that's question number one. On to question number two. Question number two is from D Collier82. Uh, he says, good to see you back on YouTube. Thank you very much. It takes too long to see your content on four wheeler. Well, you know, that's just how that is. We make a real, that's a serious TV show. We do 10 episodes of that a year and it's released in the fall. So that's what happens there. By the way, what happened to the Dakota shop truck? Now there was a lot of questions about the Dodge Dakota shop truck, where it was and what is the status of it? So. Just like question number one, I'll give you a little backstory on the Dakota shop truck. So the Dakota shop truck was built on my TV show, Four Wheeler, that I do for Motor Trend Network. 
it was an idea that just sort of came out of left field of something to build. So here's what happens when we do those shows. Uh, when we're planning our shows, what we do is we sit down at the beginning of the season, we meet with the network, I meet with the production company, Brenton Productions, that does four-wheeler, and I lay out everything that I want to build that year. And we'll leave little holes in certain episodes just because, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Some might be a new suspension company comes out and they want to have it on TV, or a new truck takes off and just goes crazy. So we leave a couple shows with a couple holes here and there. Um, and that's what happened with the Dakota shop truck. The Dakota shop truck was not planned from the beginning. It was just a show that we had left empty to put something in. And as the filming date of that show got closer, we just had to come up with a quick build project that we could do in a single show, something kind of neat. And I literally went on Facebook Marketplace probably a week before we started filming and bought a Dakota single cab pickup truck for 300 bucks and the service bed that ended up on the back. And I said, you know what, we'll just do a, you know, a cool little service beddy kind of pickup truck that people will dig. And that was the whole premise of the show and we took off and we did it. So the problem with those type of projects is they aren't high on my list of projects to get done because it was literally just a placeholder in the episode or in the series, I should say. So where is the truck right now? Well, it's behind the shop. You might see it occasionally in some of the wide shots of the shop that we put on four wheeler. I do really like the truck. I think it's kind of cool. The problem is, I don't really need to have it done because I've got a lot of other trucks I want to get done first, mainly the Jeep Comanche, and then I want to get working on the bug, I want to get started working on my VW thing. I've got to finish a truck right now for uh, Ultimate Adventure this year. So the Colorado just keeps getting pushed down, 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 and down. Will I finish it? I don't know. Uh, I have a couple people who want it, and I've jokingly said to them, well, why don't you just come pick it up and you can just finish it yourself. So. I may finish it, I may not. The reality is if I do finish it, uh, originally I'd put leaf springs on the front of it and now that I've got it all packaged up underneath the truck, it's just not gonna work. Um, there's not enough real estate in the front of that truck for leaf springs, so I'm going to have to swap it over and probably convert it to a three link on the front, which just means even more work. So it's not that I don't wanna finish it, it is on the list, it's just really down low. To be honest with you, what's probably gonna happen with that truck is it may become just like lawn art for the front of this building. I may rip the drivetrain out of it, set it up there, make it look cool in the front of the building, almost like a sign, and uh, and leave it at that and not even worry about finishing it. And then if I ever do want to finish it, it's just sitting out front. So that's where the shop truck is right now um, and how that project came to be. Bobby Boundless, he wants to know, first of all, he says, great to see you back on YouTube. Once again, thank you very much. What is your favorite Jeep power plant? Straight six, 360, V8, no limit Hemi or what? Okay, so I am a huge fan of different power plants. So my car collection right now sits at around probably I think 14 vehicles in it. And there, I think only two of them are not hardcore off-road trucks. The way I look at it is like this. Um, I want my vehicles to be different. So in Lockjaw, it's got the 5.7 Hemi with a 5.45, with a Magnum into a NP205. And so for that truck, I love the Hemi because it's like old school Jeep and the Hemi kind of fits in there really well. And I really like that. Then when I built the Comanche, it had a little four cylinder in it. And I was like, well, I don't want to put the four cylinder in it. So then I put, I'm going to put the JK V6 in it. That's perfect. Now I got one with the JK V6. 53 Willys wagon, Cummins R2.8. I've got a fully built LS in my LJ. Uh, my bomber's actually going to have a fully built LS as well. So for me, the ultimate Jeep power plant, I don't think there is one. I think it really depends on what you're doing with the project. You cannot discount a well-built LS engine for power, reliability, ease of parts, and cost to maintain. That right there makes the LS super popular and very good in any vehicle, whether it's a hot rod, rock crawler, Jeep, Baja truck, it doesn't matter. LS-based engines are probably the king of everything because they are just that. There's so many of them and there's so many variations of them now. Now we're into LTs, which make monster power. There's tons of options and they're super cheap. But I think what you have to do is you have to look at the vehicle and then decide. So for instance, I've got a uh, old Jeepster behind the shop. And I'm really kind of going back and forth as to what power plant I'm going to put in there. If I just went with my simple process, oh, you can't be in an LS, that's what I should put in it. 
But that's not how my brain works. The way my brain works is I want something cool in that Jeep that's different than what I have in my other Jeeps. So for that Jeepster, I don't know what I'm gonna put in it. Uh, I've been looking at different V6 options. I've been looking at different EcoBoost four-cylinder options, which might be kind of cool to have in that rig. So I think the answer to that question is, is there is no ultimate power plant for a Jeep. You really have to look at the vehicle and then decide. Um, and then make that call. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to keep vintage in vintage. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to keep Jeep in Jeep. And other times, if you're just looking for power, man, you cannot beat an LS-based engine. And it's that simple. Question four, the last question of this video comes from Hinmonton Hisler. Once again, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, is the 99 to 04 Super Duty Dana 60 a better axle than the 05 and up and why? And I kind of covered that in week two when I showed you the axles that I bought off Marketplace and just basically talked about why I prefer the 99 to 04. But if we're comparing apples to axle, <laughs> If we're comparing axles to axles, both on the floor in your shop, 99 to 04 Dana 60 and the 05 and up, the 05 and up is a better axle. And the reason why is because it has a uh, larger U-joint in it and it has um, a different design and already a 35 spline outer and it's actually a completely different designed outer stub shaft, which is actually a lot stronger than the 99 to 04. Uh, the reason that I prefer to work with the 99 to 04 is because, um, well, even if I get the 05 and up, I'm going to have to get the bearings redrilled because I'm going to have to get that bolt pattern changed to the eight on six and a half to match the back. And even if I was running a different axle on the back, the eight on six and a half bolt pattern, the reason that I prefer that opposed to the Ford bolt pattern, is the fact that there's just much more support out there. So when I say support, I don't mean aftermarket support. I mean, if you're out on a trail and you break a wheel, cut a tire, and maybe you don't have your spare with you, or maybe you have having an awful weekend and you've cut two tires, broken two wheels, which I have seen happen, there's a greater chance that you're gonna find somebody who can loan you a spare wheel and tire that is on the eight on six and a half bolt pattern. That's why I prefer to run that. So both axles, 99 to 04 and the 05 and up, you're gonna get the bearings redrilled anyway. So you're gonna to have to have that process done to convert them over to eight on six and a half. The 99 and 04, you're gonna to have to get that outer stub shaft machined out to a 35 spline to get the strength that you want. Now that means that the 99 to 04 needs that, but the 05 and up doesn't, and that is absolutely true. Do you need to have that larger uh, U-joint inside the axle or possibly a Big Bell RCV? I mean, I guess if you were throwing gobs of power, like eight, 900 horsepower at it, but in my opinion, if you're going down that road, what are you doing with a Dana 60 underneath the front of your truck? A better option is to build a killer bomb Spider Tracks 9 inch and put it in there. Uh, you're gonna get so much more strength and shave probably two to 300 pounds off the axle. That's my thought process on it. I hate dealing with that giant cast housing. It is a day's work to get rid of that cast housing off the side of that. Whereas the 9904, it's like 35 minutes and you're ready to start uh, putting brackets on the axle. I also prefer the 9904 because then I get to run an aftermarket freewheeling hub. I'm not relying on a uh, OEM style hub. Now, I don't know anybody who's broken a hub on the 05 and up, and I know there are some drive slugs out there for those, but there's no aftermarket support for that freewheeling hub. And once again, also, if you break that hub on the trail, what are you going to do? What are the chances that somebody has a spare 05 and up freewheeling hub for, or drive slug laying around at this point? 99 to 04 or therefore any Dana 60, 35 spline, you break that hub, you walk around and talk to anybody, they may have a hub, they may have a slug to loan you. Heck, if you find me on the trail, I'll guarantee you I have at least a drive slug that you can slide in there to get off the trail because that is one spare part that I always carry. So I think price point would also be a big thing that would play into that. The 9904 is a lot cheaper. Yes, you have to put some money into it in the end to make it as strong as the 05 and up. So I think dollar to dollar, I think the 9904 is still a better deal. Um, 
So that's why I think the 99 to 04 is a better axle. But if we're honestly just comparing them on face value, yes, the 05 and up is a better axle in stock form. In aftermarket form, I think the 99 to 04 is still a better axle, and it's the one that I'm going to go to every time. So there you go, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this first Q&A session here inside the Big Tire Garage. Once again, the way this works is go ahead and watch those weekly updates from inside the shop. I'm posting one a week. I think I'm doing them Thursday night. I looked at my, uh, my analytics on YouTube, and that's when most of my, uh, the people who are on my page are on YouTube. So as long as that stays the same, that's when they're going to come up. There might be... I might change it, but it'll be at least once a week that those will go up. If I uh, answered your question here on this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out to you via YouTube. I will ask you for a mailing address, and I will get you these sticker packs sent out to you right away through the mail. And then you'll have some stickers. Make sure you put them up and tag me on social and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, you can ask questions in this video, but I don't know if I'm going to monitor the comments as much as I am on those weekly videos. So thanks again. Thanks for tuning in every week to see what's going on inside the Big Tire Garage. And we'll see you next time. I have to finish this coffee and then get to work because there's a truck right there that needs a lot of my attention.